particularly his name, Al-Hay. Imam Al-Ghazali said that the Hay is the Fa'an. This is Sira Mubalagha. Right? So the one who is, who does a great deal of action and is very profound in his actions, at the rock also the one who is very profound in his perception. Because to have action and to have perception requires the condition of having life. And the one who is al hay the living, which implies the source of life itself, must have these qualities. Must have these qualities of action and perception. So if you find in the world the effects of action and perception there must be behind it, the quality of self-subsistent life. حَتَّى إِنَّ مَنْ لَا فِعْلَ لَهُ أَصْلًا Because the one who has no action at all from the outset and no perception at all is called dead. وَأَقَلُّ دَرَجَاتِ الْإِدْرَاكِ أَنْ يَشْعُرُ الْمُدْرِكُ بِنَفْسِهِ And the lowest level of perception is that the perceiver perceives his own self فَمَا لَا يَشْعُرُ بِنَفْسِهِ فَهُوَ الْجَمَادِ And that which does not perceive its own self is an inanimate object وَالْمَيِّتْ And something that is dead فَالْحَيُّ الْكَامِلِ الْمُطْلَقِ the complete and perfect and absolute living one, who will the yandariju jamiul mudarakat tahta idarakihi. He is the one who all perceptions subsume underneath his perception. Wa jamiul mawjudat tahta fi'lihi, and all existing things subsume under his. Action, meaning he is the one who brought about the existence of all living things, of all things in existence. حَتَّى لَا يَشُذُّ عَنْ عِلْمِهِ مُدْرَكُونَ To the point where nothing that is perceivable is, escapes from his knowledge. وَلَا عَنْ فِعْلِهِ مَفْعُولُونَ And no object of action, no effect, right, escapes from his action, escapes from being the object or the product or the outcome of his action. And this can only be for Allah Azza wa Jalla. So he is the absolute living. Imam Ahmed Zarruq says that Drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through attachment of the heart or the contemplation of the heart of His name, Al Hayy, right? As in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Al Hayyu, Al Qayyum. And takuna bayna yadayhi kal mayyati bayna yaday al ghasir. Right? So to attach one's heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al hay is that you be in his hands like the deceased person is in the hands of the one who washes him. He turns him any way he wills. And the deceased person, the dead person who's being prepared for their burial, right, is very receptive and compliant with the turning of the one who's wa washing, washing him. And you should also, if you want to be attached to al hay al qayyum then you should also be within the qada and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accepting and compliant. Meaning that you don't complain, especially you don't complain to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we're going to do any complaining, the best one to complain to is Allah. Because Allah doesn't mind if you complain to Him. But He does mind if you complain to someone else. Sayyid. And to accept the Qadr and then to respond to the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that Allah has taught you. 
in the way that Allah's Messenger والسلام, has taught you. So it doesn't mean that you go through life passively. What it means is that you are accepting of the circumstances of the test and you rise to the challenge in a way that is in keeping with the teachings and the instructions of the one who has written the test for you, who has prescribed the test. لا متحرك إلا به أمرًا لا متحرك إلا به أمرًا وقهرًا إذا ترى منه كل شيء لحياته نعم طيب When we come into a state where we realize that Allah is the source of our life and that all of this action, all of this movement, all of these events and occurrences that are the product and effect of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only point that there must be behind them a living that never dies, we realize that we must Immerse ourselves in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Immerse ourselves in the consciousness of Allah and seek out Allah. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest intention. So one person intends to do a good deed. One person intends to pray his prayer in a way that will be accepting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another person intends to pray dhuhr with all of its arkan and sunan. Another one intends not to make any mistakes. Another one intends to seek the pleasure of Allah. But still another one intends Allah. And makes that his objective. And makes Allah his intention. And makes Allah his aspiration. I'm not going to stop until I am with him as though I see him. Right? In the maqam of ihsan. So, knowing that Allah is the source of all life and the living that never dies, that raises our aspiration. That raises our himma when it is Allah that we are after. Not the comfort of our own beds. Not the comfort of comfort food. Right? Not the relaxation. Not the companionship of friends. Not the approval of people. But Allah. So sometimes we get tired. And we have to re-energize, but we get up and we keep moving toward our destination. وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ And verily your destination is to your Lord. It is said that Ayat al-Kursi contains the great name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the greatest name, al-Ism al-A'zam. It is also said that al-Hayy al-Qayyum is al-Ism al-A'zam, and in it is the secret of Allah's great name. So we seek out that name in the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to aspiration, himma, having high aspiration and spiritual ambition, or having irada from our standpoint, Ibn Ajiba says about the irada of the slave. We talked about the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it specifies and delineates the details of the configuration of how things will be when they are executed by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the irada of the divine. But what is the irada of the slave? It is the intention and the objective and the resolve to arrive to the presence of the one who is loved بِنَعْتِ mujahada, mujahada, By expending effort, by making effort to get there. وَالتَّحَبُّبْ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِمَا يَرْضَى And seeking out the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by availing oneself of the things that pleases Allah well, خُلُوصُ فِي نَصِيحَةِ الْأُمَّةِ And being sincere in wishing well and advising with the best interest of the community of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَالْأُنْسُ بِالْخَلْوَةِ 
and being comfortable when one is alone because they realize that they are alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَالصَّبْرُ عَلَى مَقَاسَاتِ الْأَهْوَالِ and being patient for the difficulty and pain of the uh, uh, frightening aspects of life وَمَنَازَلَاتِ الْأَحْوَالِ and having patience to move from one station in life or in the path toward in the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَالْإِثَارُ لِأَمْرِهِ and preferring the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all other things and preferring the command of Allah to all other things وَالْحَيَاءُ مِن نَظَرِهِ and being ashamed at the gaze of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having shame before Allah's watching one وَبَذْلُ الْمَجْهُودِ and making an effort for the sake of his beloved. And not leaving any stone unturned, not leaving any effort unpursued in order to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And being satisfied to be obscure and unknown. Sukun Wadamu Sukun al Kal Wadamu Sukun il Kalbi ila Shay in Dun al Wusul and not allowing your heart to be satisfied with anything less than arriving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wahiya awalu men zilat il qasidin and this is the first station in the path of those who seek out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa bad'u tariq as-salikeen and this is the beginning of the path of the tra of the road of the travelers Imam al-Qushayri says and all of that was a description of the irada of the seeker of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we had our definition of what it means for Allah to have irada or will or volition and here Imam Ahmad ibn Ajiba has given us the definition of what it means for the slave to have irada. Imam al Qushayri describes the irada of the slave as Tarkuma alayhi al ada is forfeiting and foregoing all habits. Okay, all habits and routines, right? The normal way of life. The way that everybody else lives. The easy life. Letting it all go and saying that I have no share in that. وَعَادَةُ النَّاسِ فِي الْغَالِبِ التَّعْرِيجُ فِي أَوْطَانِ الْغَفْلَةِ SubhanAllah. And the norm and the habit of most people most of the time is to just leave themselves in the homeland of heedlessness the countryside of heedlessness, that's what they occupy, right? That's where they prefer to be, right? So along their path in life, they just skip on over and take a stop in the pastures of what? Of ghafla, of heedlessness, of forgetfulness. وَالرُّكُونُ إِلَى اتِّبَاعِ shahwa, And feeling comfort in following one's own passions and desires. And betaking oneself, right? Leaving oneself to just waiting for death to come along. The reality of irada is nuhudul qalbi is the heart setting out, jumping up, right, to seek out the truth. And the haqq is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to seek out reality. The heart's 
waking up and jumping up out of the safety and comfort of bed, right? The safety and comfort of the big easy chair. What's the big easy chair called? Huh? The lazy boy, right? The heart jumps up out of the big easy chair and all of the safety of life and the comforts, the creature comforts, right? To seek out reality. That's irada. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu stajeebu lillahi wa lil rasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. What's our sifa? Al-hayat, life. O you who believe, respond to Allah in His Messenger when they call you to that which will give you life. To that which will enliven you. And Allah says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتْ And rely on the living, the living one who never dies. وَالْحَمْدُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The next sifa is Allah's hearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, There is not an intimate consultation amongst three except He is their fourth, nor five except that He is their sixth, nor less, nor more except that He is with them wheresoever they may be. أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا يَكُونُ مِن نَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ there is no intimate conversation between three except that he is their fourth. وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ Nor five except that he is their sixth. Nor وَلَا أَدْنَى مِنْ ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرَ Nor less nor more إِلَّا وَهُوَ مَعَهُمْ Except that he is with them أَيْنَمَا كَانُوا Wherever there are ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And then he will give them the explanation of what they've done on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of everything that we say. So there is no intimate con uh, conversation between three, except that he is their fourth, meaning that he hears. That he hears. Allah has indeed heard the statement of the woman, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ Right? So Allah hears. And what does he hear? He hears the woman. When? She complains to you about her husband, right? When she pleads you with regard to her abusive husband and carries her complaint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to jadiluka fi zawjiha wa tashtaki ila Allah wallahu yasma'u tahawarakuma and Allah hears your conversation with her. Allah is attentive to the needs of his slaves. That's part of the beauty of his hearing. He is a Sami'a, the all-hearing. He is the one who nothing is nothing that is heard is hidden from his hearing. There is no secret and there is no private conversation except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk, who's listening in? The NSA, right? But when the NSA talks, who's listening in? Allah. Right? And seeking to get nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by attachment to His name as Samia is with being vigilant over oneself in everything that a person says. Right? So if you know that Allah is listening, then you need to develop within yourself vigilance, attentiveness, awareness. What is the dhikr supposed to be doing if not waking you up and reminding you that Allah is listening? We become forgetful of Allah. And when we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the things we forget is that He's listening. And we say things that had we not been so forgetful, we would be ashamed. Right? Sometimes in a moment of bath or expansion, right, of mirth and joy and openness, a person gets a little bit silly. And they say things and later 
they're a little bit embarrassed about the things that they said. Right? But we get embarrassed about what we say in front of people. And do we think about that same way, that same feeling of embarrassment? I wish that I hadn't let myself get away from myself and made that stupid comment. What are they going to think? What if we have that same feeling with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I can't believe I said that in front of Allah. But this is what dhikr is for. Without dhikr we become heedlessness. So we said before that there were two ways that one becomes attached to the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is through the attachment of the heart and the deep contemplation and thinking about this name. And the other one is the attachment to this name and how we try to prepare ourselves to reflect the goodness whose source is that name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the modification of our own character. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a samia, ayyakuna la yu'maru lima yu'maru bihi samian that he is hearing and obeying everything that Allah has commanded him with. بِمَا يُطْلَبُ مِنْهُ وَمَا يَقْعَوْ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Everything that comes from the command of Allah Ta'ala فِيهِ حَتَّى يُكْرِمَهُ مَوْلَاهُ Such that he might gain the honor and reward of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala بِأَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ سَمْعًا Right? That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala may ultimately become the hearing with which he hears and the eye with which he sees and the foot with which he steps, and the hand with which he grasps, just like in the hadith, right? That my slave does not draw nearer to me and with anything more beloved to me than that which I have made obligatory on him. And he does not continue to draw nearer to me, right? With voluntary acts until I love him. And when I love him, I become the hearing with which he hears, and the sight with which he sees. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overtakes your hearing and overtakes control of your sight and makes your sight precise and correct and makes your hearing precise and correct and makes your footsteps precise and correct and makes your hand grasp precise and correct. Right? This is the meaning of tawfiyah. Right? This is the meaning of tawfiyah. If we understand deeply that Allah hears all things and nothing escapes from the hearing of Allah, and as they say, that Allah hears the things that are audible and hears the things that are also visual, and He sees the things that are visual and He sees the things that are audible, right? Because all of these are subdivisions of His knowledge, which is limitless and un unbounded. When we contemplate this, and we know that Allah is a as samia and we think about this deeply and we remind ourselves, if you go through the meanings that we're taking here and make dhikr in this way, right? This is a way to gain near nearness and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through contemplating these realities of the divine essence. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the all-hearing as samia what outcome do we have from that, from the deep contemplation of it and the thinking about it. This is the tafakkur that is part of our tradition. One of the outcomes is that we'll probably be more quiet and less talkative than we were before. And sumt or silence is a virtue in Islam. Inshallah, we become such that we guard our tongue more than we did before. Because we're thinking about what it is that Allah is hearing from the tongue. Right? Back when we were young in the college days, uh, we read that Abu Bakr as Siddiq, in order to reach a point where he could control his tongue like he was told to do in the teaching to the Prophet Muhammad, والسلام, he took a small stone and he put it under his tongue. So that when he went to speak, right? He felt he was agitated by the stone and he thought before he said anything. Right? So 
we went out and we tried to find the sharpest, most cornered stones, right? So not only because we didn't think it was enough to just have a stone to remind us, we needed some type of pain. Boiled it in water and we used to keep it under our tongue when we were in college. We read things in books and thought that you were supposed to do those things, right? We didn't realize that it was just for books on the shelves. Yeah, I don't if we, had, uh, if we had known then what we know now, we would have been worse off then, right? But alhamdulillah for a little bit of ignorance of the, the, the state that uh, we're in as a community, right? Guarding one's tongue is one of the outcomes in turning to Allah in supplication and invocation. So if you know that Allah hears you, then why not pray to Allah more? Why not reach out to Allah more? Why not ask of Allah more? قَدْ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تَشْتَكِئَا قَدْ تُجَادِرُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا Allah hears, right? The voice, the entreaty of the woman who implores you regarding her husband, right? So that means that Allah hears the voice of the woman who implores Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding any situation, whether it be some situation that she finds difficult, or in a situation with her children, or a concern for her family, or a concern for the well-being of her husband, or for the concern for the well-being of her own spiritual path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's nothing that He doesn't hear. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي and if my slaves ask you about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِي I am near. And he doesn't say, قُلْ لَهُمْ فَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي قُلْ لَهُمْ إِنِّي قَرِيب It's not what he says, right? He skips all of that and goes directly to it. If my slaves ask you about me, say to them, no. If my slaves ask you about me, I am near. That's how near he is. Right? There's no room for say to them. I answer the call of the caller when he calls. So let them answer me when I call them. And believe in me. Perhaps they may be guided. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and tawfiq. Moving on to the basar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, قَالَ لَا تَخَافَا إِنِّي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى He said, don't be afraid. I am with both of you. I hear and I see. Don't be afraid. So Allah is watching us, and Allah sees us, and Allah hears us. That, in and of itself, is a bit frightening. That, in and of itself, is a bit unsettling, especially when we think about our behavior in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what should it be? It should be a comfort. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. I see what's happening to you. I see what's going on. I see the sincerity of your own efforts and your trials and your struggles and your effort and what you wish for. So take resolve and take heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing you. Alam ya'alam bi anna Allah yara. Do not these kufar realize that Allah is watching them? They don't because they're in ghafla. And if I do things that make it seem like I don't realize that Allah is watching me when I'm a person who holds the aqidah of Islam. Ya Rabb, Allah help us. And however you have the satisfaction, you know that Allah is seeing what is being done, seeing what is being perpetrated. Right? And when it is being done in the rejection and denial of faith in Him, right, it will not be long-lasting. Allah may give the cowboy enough rope, but ultimately it will be enough rope for the cowboy to hang himself. So if you live in a place where there's too many cowboys, right, and you're the Indian, 
right? So if there's Indians, there's got to be cowboys, right? So you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the basir, the all seen. Right? The same thing that applies to his uh, sama, his being as samia, the all hearing, applies to his being the all seeing. And we know, when we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watchful of us, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your bodies and your outward forms. Instead, He looks at your hearts, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is witnessing me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at me. Allahu ma'i. Allahu shahidi. Allahu nazirun ilay. And what should that produce? We should have a little bit of shame. We live in a world where a lot of people do not have shame. Right? Some people don't have shame in the way they dress. Some people don't have shame in the way they carry on. But some people don't have shame in the way they treat each other. Some people dress just right, just perfect. And some people carry themselves like the best of people. But when it comes to how they treat others, they have no shame. So a person who doesn't dress right has to take that up with Allah. And a person who doesn't act right has to take that up with Allah. They are enemies of their own selves. But a person, and they need to ask Allah, will need to ask Allah to forgive them or set straight their situation with Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wasi'un alim, right? He is expansive, right? He is gentle, he is latif, he is forgiving, he is compassionate. Alhamdulillah, Allah will be our judge on the day of judgment. Because when a person has no shame in the way they treat other people, that they will have to take up with those other people. And other people are not as compassionate as Allah. Other people are not as forgiving huh, as Allah. But when we have wronged others, we give them the right to take retribution from us in front of everyone on the Day of Judgment. So if I call myself having no shame, and there are people who say, you got to do what you got to do, right? They say that they have no shame. And they'll do what they have to do. Well, they better uh, take that position that they're bold enough to do it and know that they're doing it because when the accounts are taken up on the Day of Judgment, they will be in front of the entirety of humanity. Yeah, Rabbi. But when we think about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us, inshallah it can produce some haya. Yeah, Rabbi. The first thing that my Shaykh Dr. Mahmoud Misri taught me in Damascus was that he said, we narrate from our Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin with his riwayah from Ibn Umar that he said that the Prophet والسلام, said to me, Ya Ibn Umar, Deenaka, Deenaka, Innama huwa lahmuka wa deenuka. Your deen, your deen, meaning protect your deen, protect your deen, indeed it is your flesh and blood. So take on those who are upright. وَلَا تَأْخُذْ عَنِ الَّذِينَ مَالُوا And don't take from those who are crooked. And the first thing that he taught me in Aleppo, when I went to visit him as my teacher there, he picked me up at the bus station. And I got into the car and I was in the back seat and he was in the front seat. And he turned around to me and he said, Jihad, if you believe that Allah does not see you, then that is kufr. And if you believe that Allah does, then if you believe that Allah de does see you, then don't make Him the least significant of those who see you. Yeah. Allahumma help us. 
When we know that Allah is seeing us and we know that Allah is watching us and we're attentive to that and we're attentive to the power of His vision that we see and Allah sees. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need or require or rely upon an optic nerve in order to see. And there is no barrier that can prevent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from seeing visual things. And there is no distance beyond which Allah can no longer see. And when we realize the gravity of that, and when we realize the magnificence of that, then we are more attentive, then we are more aware. And this can produce or aid us in having the maqam of muraqaba or vigilance, where we watch ourselves as Allah is watching ourselves. And we try to preempt our behavior before we do something foolish before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are attentive to the fact that Allah is vigilant or vigilant or raqib over us. And when we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us and knows us, then that produces within us a khushua, a submissiveness and humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we know that it is our hearts that Allah sees, not our bodies and our forms that He is interested in. He is interested in the condition of our hearts. <inaudible> right? Uh, verily, actions are by intentions, and intentions are in the heart. <inaudible> verily, actions are upright and empty forms, and their life is the secret of sincerity that is within them. Right? So hopefully... This inspires us to have a restlessness to pursue the tasfiyah or the purification of our own hearts. A person who is not actively pursuing the purification of their heart is someone who has not contemplated these meanings. Why do we go to a dirce of knowledge? Right? We have aspects of the fitrah that cause us to incline toward the good and inclined toward the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we are born ignorant, yet made for knowledge. We are born ignorant, yet made to know. Right? For the purpose of knowing. So we attain more completion, and when that knowing is a healthy knowing, and when that knowing is a virtue in and of itself, as opposed to, right? There are two types of knowledge. There is a knowledge that is worship and matlub and sought out in and of itself and there is a reward and an honor for it in and of itself and that is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all things associated with that and there is knowledge that if you were to use it it is more like know-how if you were to use it to help each help other people and improve the society, right? With some intention beyond just getting a paycheck at the end of the month, then you might receive a reward for that knowledge. But if you take a broom and you sweep the porch, or you go and you clear some type of danger or some type of obstacle out of the road, right? You can also get a reward if you do it for the right intention. Right? The knowledge that is praised in the tradition of Islam is not the, the knowledge of science, right? not the knowledge of technology. And we do ourselves a silly disservice when we try to employ the verses of the Qur'an and the statements of the Prophet ﷺ in praise of how to build a factory and how to run and manage a factory. Because that's not what the Prophet ﷺ came to this world for. Right? This is not what he came to do. He came to take you from darkness to light. Right? That is a different program. Right? These other programs go on as a means to support greater ends. Right? Not just to put milk in the fridge and bread in the cupboard. Right? That is a means to an end. Right? Not an end in itself. 
cattle exist to graze. That's their end. That's their objective in life, is to graze, to eat, sleep, and procreate. That's what animals do. When we become materialists and materialistic, right? لَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ Right? If we rise up to the reason and the meaning for our existence and the reason why we're created, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ but if we give up all of that and we exist for no other reason than to eat, sleep, and procreate, maybe show off a little bit, right? So cows don't show off to their friends, at least I don't think that they do, right? Maybe to show off a little bit to keep up with the Joneses. Oh man, they got a boat. They got a jet ski, right? We got to get a jet ski, okay? Uh, what kind of grass seed is he using over there, right? And we look that up on the internet. Then we send him down to the lowest of low. Right? The most hated beast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the summul bukul ladina la yaqilun. Right? The deaf and the dumb that do not use their intellect. In hum kel an am. Right? They are like cattle. Belhum adalu sabila. No. Right? Instead, they are worse than cattle. Because they were created for something greater. Cattle were created for you to eat them. That's what cattle were created for, to be eaten. Okay? To be treated with care and kindness. Right? But ultimately, to be eaten. That's what cattle were created for. But human beings were not created for that. Right? To graze and move along with the herd. The herd mentality. al muraqaba Idamatu ilm al-abdi bittila'i rab Vigilance is the slaves maintaining and sustaining an awareness that Allah is watching him. أو القيام بحقوق الله سرا وجهرا خالصا من الأوهام or rising up to carry the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or respect the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in private and in public with sincerity and without delusion. Right? We lie to ourselves and we delude ourselves. One time my wife told her neighbor, right, who came to the door in the morning with a box of Pop-Tarts, she said, you know there's gelatin in that. And she said, oh, I was purposely not reading the label and now you ruined it for me. Right? So we try to uh, deceive ourselves and deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? What should a person say in that type of situation? Because that's actually happened to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you think that, if you think that uh, that it will be helpful, and if you think the person cares, but if you know the person doesn't care, you know, you can try to be helpful. It's not our job to go snooping about and sneaking around and trying to find people making mistakes. Right? We're taught to respect the privacy of others. I don't need to know. Okay? But if it's obvious and clear, and there we go, right? You might want to bring it to someone's intention, especially if they care. Right? And leave it to them if they don't care. So we fool ourselves and kid ourselves. Right? Uh, like wiping over our socks. Okay? We fool ourselves and kid ourselves, but we know we're praying without wudu. Right? My son brought home, they, giving him a test on how to wipe over your socks. Right? An eight-year-old boy, you're training him to wipe over his socks. If you want to go wipe over French socks, right, go do that. But don't indoctrinate a generation of children. Right? They're going to grow up and they're going to hate you. Right? We know people, right, from our generation, who said that they will 
not forgive their parents in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment because they never taught them their deen. Right? Is people feel that they need to be engaged in interest. I tell you, if you have to, if you feel that you're going to get engaged in interest, then get engaged in interest and ask Allah to forgive you. But don't change the religion. If you don't want to make wudu properly, don't make wudu properly. But don't tell people that it's okay. If you don't want to eat halal, right, then by all means, go eat carrion, right? La ikraha fideen, there's no coercion in religion. If you want to eat dead flesh, eat dead flesh. But don't say that it's halal. Right? Don't fool people. And don't fool a generation of children. They're going to grow up thinking that this is okay. I feel sorry for the post 9-11 generation of Muslim kids. Right? What a mess. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins, but He won't forgive you if you change His deen. If you make tahrif of the deen itself, because you are misleading whole generations. It's one thing to sin, you can ask Allah to forgive you. But it's another thing to deceive others about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ask Allah to forgive us. Say it. And about the seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Say to them, work, make effort, because Allah will see your effort in His Messenger and the believers. And you will be returned to someone who knows the public and the private. Allah give you all tawfiq. Let us do our final attribute, okay? Which is speech. Kalam. The kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says about His kalam in the Quran, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا And Allah spoke to Musa directly. وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِّرْهُ if one of the idolaters seeks from you asylum, grant it to him so that he may hear the word of Allah. Right? فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ Allah. The kalam Allah is very important. The speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his attribute. His attributes are subsisting with His exalted essence and like His exalted essence have no beginning and they have no end. His kalam is eternal. And we are enabled, first because we have a soul, second because we have before us the Qur'an, to access, to gain access to that eternal speech. Many of us, we read the Qur'an every day. And sometimes when we read it, we fall asleep. And sometimes when we read it, right, we're barely paying attention. And sometimes when we read it, we're taking it for granted. But do realize that what is between these two covers is access to eternity. Access to the eternal. Access to a timeless dimension of meaning that subsists with the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we say that the Qur'an is uncreated. How is that possible? Right? We say things, but do we understand what those things mean? The Qur'an is created, but what happens when your Qur'an gets damaged? Maybe water gets on it and it gets warped. It can't be used anymore. Right? And we have to find some way to sort of respectfully... Uh, put it out to pasture, right? In some places they might burn the old and damaged Qur'ans. How is that uncreated? If it's something that we can burn, it's something that can get damaged, something that's timeless can't get damaged. Right? If we know, how is it uncreated when somebody printed it in a printing press? Right? Somebody wrote the calligraphy by hand. Right? And put it between two covers. Like Shaykh Adib uh, used to say, Rahmatullahi alayhi, 
he said the, the ink just dried, right? It just came off the presses, and we killed the ghazal yesterday and tanned the hide in order to create the leather, the, the, the leather cover. So how is it uncreated? The Qur'an is uncreated because the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is meaning. And it subsists with His exalted essence. And what you have in the Mus'haf are symbols on paper. Those symbols enable and empower the human soul to comprehend meaning. And that meaning is not on the paper. That meaning exists in the Malakut. Bel the Jabarut. Right? Beyond this profane dunya. And the soul is enabled to access that meaning through the calligraphy on the page. So yes, the ink on the page is created, but the meanings toward which it points are uncreated. Sheikh Hadib used to write on a piece of paper the word na fire on paper and then he would say would you touch this right or are you cautious right and obviously we're not afraid to touch the words fire on paper he said but the meaning of it you touch the word fire but the actual reality of fire that that word points to would you touch that no there's a difference between the lafil which is created and the meaning, which in the case of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uncreated. The kalam of Allah is His attribute, and therefore transcendent and uncreated, unlike that of created human language, which only exists through the medium of letter and voice. The existence of a speech that is without letter or voice. We say that the Qur'an doesn't have letter or voice. It is pure meaning. We require letters on paper. And we require someone reciting the Qur'an to us with their voice in order to access and comprehend and app apprehend through the faculty of our soul that uncreated timeless meaning that is without letter and without voice. Bila harf wa bila sawt. Unlike that of created human speech which only exists through the medium of letter and voice. The existence of a speech that is without letter or voice as we find in our very selves. If I have thoughts to myself, there is meaning within me that I have not yet pronounced. That I have not yet enunciated that I have not yet given voice to. There are ideas within me that don't have letters attached to them. Were I to try to convey them to you, or maybe even work them out in my own mind, I might start shaping them and framing them. But the kalam, the speech and the meaning within you doesn't have letter and doesn't have voice. So what about? the possibilities of the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be beyond and transcendent of letter and voice. Right? Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said, right? Hayyatu fi nafsi kalaman. When he was going into the meeting hall of Bani Saqifa, to decide who the first khalifa would be after the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? I prepared some speech Right? In my soul, within my heart. Okay? And that would have been a speech that doesn't have letter and voice. So that makes us or enables us to understand how a law could possess meanings without letter and voice. The existence of a speech that is without letter or voice, as we find in our own very selves, is a type of speech that is without letter or speech. The poet said, Indeed, speech is in the breasts, and verily, the tongue has been made for the breast, not but an indicator. Do you recall the words in Arabic? Innama al-kalamu, innama al-kalamu fil-fu'adi, wa ju'ilat al-lisanu, ala al-fu'adi dalilan. 
something along those lines. Labid. Uh, Al Bayhaqi said, Kalam is what the speaker says, and it takes residence in his self, within his soul. As in the hadith of Omar, in the incident of As Saqifa, I had prepared a statement, Maqalatun, within myself. And in another narration, Kalaman. So he called it Kalaman before he spoke it, before it had letter, and before it had voice, he called it Kalam. Just like we say that the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is without letter and voice. And this was mentioned in uh, by Ibn Hajar and Fath al-Bari. And Allah has the greater example. The book of Muslims termed the Qur'an or Mus'haf contains symbols written in ink, written on paper, which indicate the meanings of Allah's eternal speech. The attributes of Allah, so that was the Qur'an, it contained symbols that were written on paper and those symbols point toward the eternal meanings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kalam, that is the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sometimes called Qur'an but is usually called Kalam Allah. The Mus'haf we have before us is sometimes called Kalam Allah, but is usually called Qur'an, and in this way the Qur'an is uncreated. Tayyip? And of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the command of Allah, is what is more important to us than trying to decide whether it's created or not, is that He is فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيدُ He is the one who does whatever He wishes. So if you need something done, then know where to go. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who does what He wants huh? and chooses. And they have no choice in the matter. Right? And when He wants something done, what does He say? His words, kun. And it is. Be, and it is. And for that reason, right? The knowers by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say that the entirety of our existence is between the calf and the noon. Good. That's where it all happens. In the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we understand the uncreatedness of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we comprehend that we have access to it, that might be a good inspiration to inspire us to seek knowledge of Allah. Because when we seek knowledge of the deen of Islam, we are seeking out something that is eternal. Something that is fundamentally different than the mundane that surrounds us. When we realize the depth of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that it is access to a timeless space, right? It helps us have more intimacy when reciting His speech. It enables us to understand why it's so important to protect the symbols that point in the direction of timeless meaning, the Mus'haf itself. Because this is the thing that gives you access to something beyond the physical world. Right? And if we understand the nature of the speech of Allah and what it truly means, instead of worrying and arguing and thinking about, well, how is it without voice? Well, let's just make sure that if we are ever addressed directly by the kalam of Allah, Ya Abdi, my slave, do you acknowledge that you did this, this, and this? Yes, Rabbi, I acknowledge it. Right? Do you acknowledge that this happened and this happened and this happened? That's the, how we should be taking the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seriously. And that's what should generate within us the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fear of being addressed by Allah, and He is taking us to task, right? And He is not pleased with us, which is different than how the people of the Jannah will be addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The Jannah is far off, right? And in the American uh, popular culture, what is heaven, right? It's a place that's all white, you're walking on clouds, everybody's wearing white and carrying harps, and nobody listens to harps anymore, right? And nothing's there but just all white, 
right? It's quiet. It looks like it might even be a bit chilly, right? Not very interesting. But what if you knew that the paradise was a place that after you're in it, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to the people of paradise and says, Are you content? And they say, How could we not be content? You have given us what you have given no other people, right? In existence. And he said, I'm going to give you something that is going to make you even more happy. And they say, How is that possible? He said, ridwani. Allah says to you, I will release my contentment upon you. And I will never be angry with you ever again. Right? This is a beautiful thing. And this is Allah. This is how we want Allah to speak to us. Not, Abdi, do you remember such and such a day? You did this, this, and we'll be forced to say, I remember. Right? And so on and so on and so forth. Right? In Surah Al-Luqman, وَلَوْ أَنَّ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْ شَجْرَةٍ أَقْلَامٌ وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ سَبْعَةُ أَبْحُرٌ If the trees of the earth were pens in the ocean, with seven more to supply it were ink, مَا نَفِدَتْ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّ كَلِمَاتُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ The words of Allah would not be exhausted. Right? The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not be exhausted. Barakallahu feekum and congratulations you all completed the section of the Ilahiyat. When we meet again next time we'll begin the Nubuwat. Ahsanallahu alaykum. Were there any questions before we start? Before we uh, close? Say it Quran. Um, how do we create uh, environments of purification of the heart? in this society that seems so dedicated to arousing the desires and still being able to go to work in school? Not well, it's important to be engaged with the real world. Okay, so ultimately any type of teaching and any type of purification and any type of travel of the spiritual path has to be a travel of the spiritual path that is built for participation, that is built for engagement. Because this is the circumstance that Allah has put us in. He has not put us in a Shangri-La where everyone is a righteous, pious believer and there are no distractions. Okay? He has put us in a place where there are many distractions. Where holding on to one's deen is like holding on to a red-hot coal. Where the blessing and the edger and the reward of one of you is 50 times that of the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they said, why is that Rasulullah? When we're the Sahaba, right? And he said, لِأَنَّكُمْ تَجِدُونَ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ أَعْوَانَ وَهُمْ لَا يَجِدُونَ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ أَعْوَانَ Because you find help to do right, and they will find no help to do right. So the struggle itself is a blessing. The struggle itself, if you choose, this is your mission, if you choose to accept it, right, in itself is a reward that will help you in the success of your mission. And this message will self-destruct in five minutes, right? <laughs> or 60 seconds. I'll tell you. So we have to create environments, we have to create communities that are open communities, yet places that have an atmosphere that is set in such a way that it supports and uplifts the soul as opposed to and strengthens the resolve of the soul as opposed to distracting the nufus and the lower self right so when the stronger cell souls go out right they might take other souls along with them right they say at the end of some of the majalis in damascus and persist in the remembrance of the one who is truly independent and without need of all others. And be a person who is not in need of anyone because character 
steals from character. Right? Your character steals from the character of those who you keep company with. Right? So look and be careful of the people that you keep company with. And be a person who it's good for others to steal. Right? To mimic or imitate your character. Right? And that can be done in a supportive environment. But we need to have environments. Right? And if the masajid are not suitable places for this mission, then we need to either give some emergency critical treatment to that masjid and if the patient is unwilling then we need to build new masjid right we need to build new places where we can have that environment because there are believers who want to get to Allah right we can sit around all day and talk about how nice it would be good to go to Aleppo right and there used to be people who used to go up to Aleppo Right? And it was so nice, and they came back with all types of stories. And yeah, you know, my grandfather went to Aleppo, but it's another thing to just get on a bus with a bunch of people that are going to go to Aleppo. Right? At some point that has to happen. Some people just want to get on the bus and get there. Other people are not interested. Right? Other people are not interested. They used to tell a story about a man who was a garbage collector. And he spent his whole life collecting garbage. But he was a smart man. He was an intelligent man, right? And the little bit of money he made, he invested it well. And he raised his children really, really well. And they were intelligent. And he had them educated. And the whole family was lifted out of poverty and moved in. Right? To, with the Beverly Hillbillies. Right? <laughs> As kinfolk said, Jed, get away from there. <laughs> right? Beverly Hills, is California is the place where you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is. Right? <clears throat> so they moved into the nice neighborhood. And there was nothing that they wanted for. Right? They had nice cars. They had the brand new model of cars. They had plush homes. They had everything, fine clothes. But, every week or so, the father would go off, and no one would know where he went. He would disappear, and then he would come back, right? And one day, the sons who were used to this lifestyle, they followed their father, and they watched him. He went back to the poor side of town, and he went to the garbage dump. And he would go, and he would sit in the middle of the trash, and just put the trash over him, and just sit in the garbage, right? And be so comfortable, right? And they'd say, they went up to him and said, Baba, why are you doing this? And he said, I spent so much time of my life with the garbage, that the smell, right, is so familiar to me, and it makes me comfortable, and I miss it, mm -hmm. right? So there are people who they have been with the garbage and the filth, the filth of their own egos first and foremost, right? The filth of their attachment so much that they're used to the smell and they don't notice it anymore, right? And they're happy to be there. But if you don't want to sit in a filthy garbage dump with a bunch of najasa of egotistical egos, right? Then you've got to get out of there. We gotta get out of this place. If it's the last thing we ever do, we gotta get out of this place. Right? Brother, there's a better life for me and you. Right? If we wanna move along. Right? We can't just stick with the status quo, because the status quo is taking us backwards. And before you know it, you're old and you're on the verge of passing out of this world. Right? And what did you right, gain from it while you were there? Um, how can we do this with keeping up with the times and technology? Because that's, that, that's kind of hard to balance. You can do this, right? By keeping up and keep up with the times and the technology. One, because you are part of time. You can't escape from time. And technology 
by making technology a means to greater ends instead of an end in itself. That's the difference. No one said, leave technology, right, where it's useful, where it supports you, right? There's a lot of technology, right, that is not useful, okay? If I'm not going to be uh, developing some type of robotics for the future, then I don't need to be consumed with YouTube videos about dancing robots. Right? I understand that somebody needs to go through the phase of creating dancing robots. Right? But if I'm not a robotics professor, professional, right? that's a technology that I don't need. Okay? Maybe a, tech, a toaster, a more improved toaster will show up one day, and when it does, I can buy it. Okay, I can do all types of things with my smartphone, right? In fact, I rely too much on my smartphone. Okay, I couldn't switch from iPhone, right? I do a lot with this. I have research apps, right? I have uh, uh, Quran search apps. I even have uh, tons and tons of books of knowledge that I actually use in my own research, and I can research it right here on my phone, right? And there's a million other things I can do with this. Right? I have an app that tells me where the train is and when it's going to reach the platform, if it's going to reach the platform before or after the connecting train. Right? I can transfer money to pay my bills with this. But that's not what I'm about. That facilitates other things that I'm about. And what happens in our life is that we either live for the technology or we live for the means. Right? I have to pay attention to my career. I have to build my career. I have to have it gone, right? But hopefully I'm about something more than my career and I'm not defined for my job. It's about keeping balance, right? Huh? And la tukh fa'aqimu al-wazna bil qisti wa la tukhsiru mizan So establish the balance. The harmony in the universe is promised to no one. It is the steward's job to maintain the harmony. That is one of the key requisites and requirements of Khilafah. So keeping the balance, right? Why? Because I can't be the useless slave, right? The useless slave that when his master calls on him, right? He can't do anything right that Allah talks in the Quran. So the person who doesn't care about their job and doesn't care about their career because all they care about is going to hang out in the masjid at night and sit against the wall with their feet pointed toward the qibla. Right? That's what goes on here. These people are losers at work and they're losers in the masjid. Right? I have to maintain a career, right, but not be defined by the career. It's very easy to do. The ulama of this deen were at the cutting edge of their moment, right, back in their time. That was their sunnah. So if we were to follow their sunnah, it wouldn't be that we were to live in their time with their mindset and try to force some pre-modern time into this world, but it would be that we'd be on the cutting edge of our time, but for a purpose and a mission in life. A purpose and a mission in life. But that doesn't mean also that we mix technology with our deen. My deen is not about what I can do with the iPhone. This is technology. Okay? My worshipping at the altar of progress is just weakness and inferiority that I inherited because I am from a country that lagged behind the European Industrial Revolution. Let's shake ourselves loose from that. Many of you are not from that country, right? I defy you to tell me that you're from Pakistan. Because if I wrap you up and send you back to Pakistan, you will not survive. You know how I know? Because your parents who were born there can't survive there anymore. Right? I've seen it happen. I've seen people try to go back to Syria and open up a practice. They last two, three years back to the States. Alhamdulillah, the house didn't sell, right? And they come all the way back, rebuy the car and do all of this because they can't make it. You're from this world, huh? You're from this world. And so you don't have to have that inferiority baggage, 
right? You don't have to have that inferiority baggage. But our masajid tend to indoctrinate ourselves with these weaknesses, to be weak people, to think that because I embrace technology and I embrace progress and I embrace modernity, right, somehow I am stronger. Why are you in your house of worship talking about science? What is that all about? Okay? There are different paradigms, and we betake ourselves to paradigms according to need. Alright? If it's my job to build a super toaster, well then I need to be in the paradigm of science while I'm doing that. But what I'd rather do is to be about the soul and the intellect. Why? Because the physical sciences have nothing to do with intellect. They have nothing to do with reason or rationality. Right? They have to do with observing things with the five senses and marking down what we observe over and over again until we can make predictions about relationships between causes and effect and bold a few things together to make a super toaster. I would rather just buy the super toaster from Macy's, right, or William Sonoma, right, and then do something that brings life to my soul because the super toaster can't bring life to my soul.